200 years ago, on July 4th, 1776, the Founding Fathers joined together and penned the Declaration of Independence. The effect was world-shaking. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, We are not for ourselves alone, but for the whole human race. Even before 1776, Americans became aware of a particular destiny. They took a stand on principles and proclaimed a philosophy. And in this cause, the American citizen was and is inspired to action. He has sweated and toiled, growled and cursed, and with a prayer for victory on his lips, he has died. If we desire to avoid insults, we must be able to repel it. If we desire to secure peace, it must be known that we are at all times ready for war. Though they are the most absolute cowards on the face of the earth, they are just now worked up to such a degree of enthusiasm that they are easily persuaded that whatever they undertake, they must be invincible. I begin to see what a price liberty asks, that folk must learn to hold together, for they have only God and themselves. The name American, which belongs to you, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism. To be a soldier, a man must have discipline, self-respect, pride in his unit and his country, a high sense of duty and obligation to his comrades and to his superiors, and self-confidence born of demonstrated ability. To see men without clothes to cover their bodies, without blankets to lie on, without shoes, for want of which their marches might be traced by the blood of their feet, is proof of the patience and obedience which, in my opinion, can scarce be paralleled. Spirit that made those heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nations gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. It was at the field at Yorktown in 1781 that it was finally decided, after six and one half years of heroic struggle, that the shot heard round the world had not been fired in vain. The play is over. The fifth act has come to an end. After this attempt, what English general will undertake the conquest of America? The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are entrusted to the hands of the American people. Providence has in a particular manner blessed America with a variety of soils and watered it with innumerable streams. This country and this people seem to have been made for each other. These united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. Britain nursed a bitter hatred for her former rebellious colonies, 
The War of 1812 would see British men of war waiting off the coast and foreign troops once again on American soil. Thousands of American citizens, under the safeguard of their national flag, were torn from their country and from everything dear to them. We must oppose the further encroachments of Great Britain by war, or formally annul the Declaration of Independence. Fast brigs were built and outfitted with naval guns. Shipyards met the crisis as citizens took up local collections to build and launch lofty frigates. It is by no means enough that an officer of the Navy should be a capable mariner. He should be as well a gentleman of liberal education, refined manners, punctilious courtesy, and the nicest sense of personal honor. How could it happen that our British ships have been beaten by a piece of striped bunting, flying at the masthead of a few fur-built frigates manned by bastards and outlaws? The gallant exploits of our naval heroes prove to the world our inherent capacity to maintain our rights on one element, the sea. Good seamanship, self-reliance, and a sense of ultimate responsibility are the first requisites in a seaman and naval officer. gave Americans what they so essentially lacked, a national character founded on glory common to all. Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My paramount objective is to save the Union. A house divided against itself cannot stand. In your hands, my dissatisfied countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The guns that saluted the 16th President of the United States ushered in the nation's bloodiest war. A war of brother against brother. The 
president's call for troops, the rolling of the drums, the patriotic appeals, brought out 91,000 volunteers, many of whom had never before fired a rifle. Listen, young heroes, your country is calling. Time strikes the hour for the brave and the true. Now, while the foremost are fighting and falling, fill up the ranks that have opened for you. Most competent high-ranking officers on both sides were West Point graduates. The art of war is simple enough. Find out where your enemy is. Get at him as soon as you can. Strike him as hard as you can, and as often as you can, and keep moving on. The innovations of Ulysses Grant, William Sherman, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and the naval maneuvers of Admiral David Farragut were to become an integral part of basic military strategy. But the war would be fought man to man. All along the road for miles, wounded men were lying. They crawled or hobbled slowly away from the fury of the battle, become exhausted and laying down by the roadside to die. What must have been their agony, Mother, as they lay in the dreary woods, sensible that there was no one to comfort or to care for them, and that in a few hours more their career on Earth would be ended. It was not until after Gettysburg and Vicksburg that the recruits had become soldiers. Then our men had learned in the dearest school on earth the simple lessons of war. Then we had brigades, divisions, and corps which could be handled professionally. And it was then that professional soldiers could rightly be held to just responsibility. Let North and South, let all Americans, let all lovers of liberty join in readopting policies harmonious with the Declaration of Independence. Soldiers again became civilians. Uniforms, medals, and weapons, only mementos of the past. So three major wars were fought before a man could say, these United States. The country withstood its greatest crisis. We had proved ourselves. We were a nation. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war. To the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. The greatest victories were yet to be won, the greatest deeds yet to be done, and that there were yet in store for our peoples and for the causes that we upheld grander triumphs than had yet been scored. It was a fearful thing to lead this great peaceful people into war. But the right was more precious than the peace. And we fought for the things which we've always carried nearest our hearts. For democracy. For the rights and liberties of small nations. To make the world at last free. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine. To be proud her boys delight. 
The Doughboy and the Marine would establish the reputation of the American fighting man in Europe. He dug in and held 100 miles of the line. We are swept by machine gun fire and a constant barrage is on us. I have no one on my left and only a few on my right. I will hold. While in the skies above, there appeared a new American soldier, the aviator. It is probable that future war will be conducted by a special class, the Air Force, as it was by the armored knights of the Middle Ages. trenches. Has anyone thought who has stood in one of those trenches what a measureless history it held? What a stately poem and mighty and awful hymn it held? What a history there holds in the crumbling contents of trenches? I pay the supreme tribute to the officers and soldiers of the line. When I think of their heroism, their patience under hardships, their unflinching spirit of offensive action. I am filled with emotion which I am unable to express. unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. The people of the United States have already formed their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. From Berlin, Rome, and Tokyo, we have been described as a nation of weaklings, 
playboys who would hire British soldiers or Russian soldiers or Chinese soldiers to do our fighting for us. Let them repeat that now. Let them tell that to General MacArthur and his men. Let them tell that to the sailors who today are hitting hard in the far waters of the Pacific. Let them tell that to the boys in the flying fortresses. Let them tell that to the Marines. These are the times that try men's souls. Tom Paine wrote those words on a drumhead by the light of a campfire. That was when Washington's little army of ragged, rugged men was retreating across New Jersey, having tasted naught but defeat. Washington's conduct in those hard times has provided the model for all Americans ever since. A model of moral stamina. He held to his course as it had been chartered in the Declaration of Independence. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the sacrifice, the more glorious the triumph. These proceedings are closed. The seeds of totalitarian regimes are nurtured by misery and war. They spread and grow in the evil soil of poverty and strife. They reach their full growth when the hope of a people for a better life has died. We must keep that hope alive. The free men of the world have but one choice if they are to remain free. They must oppose strength with strength. point of a century of continuing challenge. We sense with all our faculties that forces of good and evil are masked and armed and opposed as rarely before in history. The American fighting man has not given of himself merely to defend his home for the moment that was passing, but so that his family, his neighbors, and all of his fellow men might live in peace in the days to come. For the men who suffered at Valley Forge and won at Yorktown, 
and lost their lives in foreign lands, gave themselves to the cause of freedom. And thus, Abraham Lincoln at Independence Hall concluded. I have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this Confederacy so long together. It was that sentiment in the Declaration of Independence And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor.